everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Strauss. I am Senior Vice President of the American Astronomical Society. I'm delighted today to introduce the plenary talk of Professor Joe Dunkley of Princeton University. Joe is a world leader in the study of the cosmic microwave background and its use as a cosmological tool. She has played a leading role in forefront CMB experiments over the past two decades. The Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, WMAP, the Planck Satellite of the European Space Agency, and the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, ACT, and now the Simons Observatory. Her work has been recognized with numerous prizes. As a member of the WMAP and Planck teams, she has twice been awarded the Gruber Prize in Cosmology. She is an officer of the Order of the British Empire, and last year was awarded the New Horizons in Physics Prize of the Breakthrough Prize Foundation. She is the author of a wonderful book bringing modern astronomy to the layperson called Our Universe, an Astronomer's Guide, published by Harvard University Press. Jo tells me that she once backpacked across South America and passed unknowingly within a few miles of what is now the location of the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. Today, she's gonna to bring this full circle and tell us about the Atacama Cosmology Telescope and the Simons Observatory, the millimeter wave sky from Chile. Welcome, Joe. Joe, you're muted at the moment. I am now unmuted. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael, for that kind introduction. Um, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, but actually, before I start, I just I want to acknowledge my privilege as a white woman and even being here and being a professor and being at Princeton and able to at least even partly focus on science at the moment. Um, I'm, my full support is behind the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and, um, and I wanted to say that up front. But now on to the science. Um, let's, I'm going to talk to you about um, this great, this beautiful site up in the north of Chile, the Atacama Desert, um, where pictured here is a site where we are currently conducting a number of cosmic microwave background experiments. You see them in the forefront here and in the background um, you see ALMA. This is the site in the north of Chile um, up at about 5,000 meters elevation. Um, and so we've been in the business of looking at the cosmic microwave backgrounds for more than 50 years now. Um, the CMB was detected in 1960s using this wonderful radio antenna actually not so far from here um, in where I am now in New Jersey. Um, and so this was a detection of light from the beginning of the universe. The earliest image we have or the earliest light we have coming from a time when the universe was only 400,000 years old. At that time, there were absolutely no stars, no galaxies, and all we had was this plasma of photons and baryons and also some dark matter around as well. Um, the conditions back then were entirely different to how they are now. And when we look at this microwave background light, we see that at the time, the universe was behaving like a perfect black body. And if I, the, the, the plot in the, in the corner shows down here, shows the intensity of the micro background as a function of wavelength measured by the cosmic, um, uh, by the COBE satellite about 30 years ago. And as you see, um, you know, the, the peak now, now that this light has redshifted from redshift of about 1100 today, the peak wavelength is at a millimeter but we typically make measurements um, of this light in the one to a few millimeters wavelengths. And I'll say more about that. Um, so we've actually seen, when we zoom in on the cosmic microwave background in more detail, it's been observed increasingly with these um, uh, increasingly precise satellite experiments as well as ground-based data. We had COBE and then WMAP and then Planck. And the re most recent, more, you know, best known recent image of the CMB certainly comes from the Planck satellite. I'd shown here, this is an all sky image of the anisotropy, the variations in the temperature of the CMB all around us um, uh, as variations around a mean temperature of 2.7 Kelvin. The scale is, is, is really tiny here. The scale is a few hundred, um, few hundreds of a micro Kelvin, um, where the red is hot and the blue, blue is colder than average. Ever so subtle variations in the temperature uh, in the universe at redshift of 1100 at a time of around 400,000 years after the beginning of the universe. 
And really this image, this image is a snapshot of the universe as it was back then. This intensity pattern really traces out more or less the density of this photon baryon plasma back at that time. Um, and again, these seeds, these, these tiny features where the universe is slightly more or less dense than average. Those are the features that will grow under gravity over millions of years to form the first stars, the first galaxies. Um, and so we've seen this now over the whole sky um, and, and it does give us a very nice snapshot of the physics going on at that time. The Planck satellite has also measured not only the intensity of this light coming from that, that, that epoch, but also its polarization. You can measure not just the intensity, but the polarization, the orientation of the light. Um, and it turns out that the micro background gets polarized um, essentially from the scattering of, of photons off infalling electrons to, for example, overdense regions, such that if you can make a measurement of the polarization of this micro background light, you're really getting a snapshot of the velocity or the motion of this primordial photon baryon plasma at redshift of 1100. So this image shows you the, the, the intensity of the light. Planck has made measurements of the polarization and I'm going to show you more of those uh, today. Um, when, we, when we look at this, this image, the physics back then at just 400,000 years of time was incredibly linear. The universe was rather featureless. Things hadn't begun to collapse and form structures. And so when we take that image, we really, the most of the information is contained in its power spectrum, where this is, this is an example from the Planck satellite, where you decompose that map as a function of angular scale uh, along here, angular scale from you know, 90 degree scales through degree scales down to sub degree scales. And we plot the, ver the power spectrum or the variance or the amount of bumpiness <laughs> using various, various levels of technicalities um, as a function of scale. Um, and the red points are the points measured from the Planck satellite. Um, and, and as you see, they're, very, they're, they're rather featureful. They, they're fit, they're, they have this, there's particular features that come from the physics that was happening at the time the CMB formed which was at this epoch, 400,000 years, when the universe cooled enough to become neutral for photons to stop scattering and just to travel freely to us. Um, every universe looks unique. Um, what we do is we can predict this, this power spectrum theoretically for any given universe, given its ingredients and given whatever initial conditions were put in at the beginning, for example, just after the Big Bang. And we tweak it until we find this green curve that fits the data. Um, the physics that's happening to produce that is we think that some mechanism that's either inflation or something else at the beginning put in some initial uh, over and under dense regions and they then propagated in the universe. And so um, uh, over densities in this coupled photon baryon plasma would have competed that with density versus pressure in this uni in the early universe to send out sound waves. Sound waves would have been traveling through this plasma until they were caught at redshift of 1100 at time 400,000 years and imprinted as this particular signal. And so we see that those, those physical features on, this, circ on this, this little image as these physical features of length lambda imprinted at an angle. Uh, and the angle is also set by the distance that the CMB is from us. And so we're sensitive in the CMB to the contents of the universe that affect both the early physics and then how far away the CMB is from us and the initial features that go in. And this data is extremely well fit by the Lambda CDM cosmological model. That's our favorite cosmological model right now, a flat universe with baryons, cold dark matter, um, and a cosmological constant with very simple initial conditions. Now we think of, this is, this is where we get really the, those, those primary just um, parameters or cosmological quantities from. But the CMB has much more than that because it's a backlight. It's the most distant light we have, but the cosmic structure that it sees on the way affects it too. It travels through the universe to reach us and it has these key effects um, um, that, that distort the signal. The first is gravitational lensing. The CMB is gravitationally lensed by all of the matter lying in between us and last scat the last time the CMB scattered at redshift of 1100. And so that we just, that distorts the CMB. 
Um, so we can, we're sensitive to the mass lying between here and that very high redshift. Um, it's sensitive to hot electrons, hot electrons in particular in galaxy clusters. This is the thermal Sunyev Zordovich effect uh, that those hot electrons uh, scatter the CMB photons and actually slightly shift that black body spectrum to a different frequency such that clusters show up as, a, as, as having a shifted uh, a shift in their, in their CMB black body, and we can detect that. Then there's also this kinetic scenario of the Dovich effect, which comes from the motion of electrons in the universe between us and the CMB, um, such that you get little sort of dipole effects from the motion of large scale structure that gets imprinted on the CMB. This is very subtle signal. And so these are, si these are signatures that we are, have just begun to be seeing in the microwave background that actually show up as we're able to look at it in, in finer detail. So we're sensitive to all these late time universe effects. It's not just a snapshot of the early universe. And when we go about looking at the, the microwave background, we're actually conducting not just a CMB survey, but a, but a millimeter survey, because um, there's all sorts of things that are emitting in the millimeter. Um, it's not just the CMB, there's also our wonderful galaxy and all the other galaxies out there that are, for example, emitting, in this case, thermal dust emission. This is this beautiful image from Planck showing, um, this is a, you know, a third of a millimeter, showing the emission from hot dust, from thermally emitting dust, hot dust, thermally emitting dust in our galaxy and from other galaxies too. Um, and so we sort of, uh, sometimes it's approached from the CMB perspective as, oh, these are our foregrounds, these are the things we're trying to get rid of. They're actually this enormously rich wealth of, of information at these wavelengths. Um, if we look at the sky in not just intensity, but in polarization, again, this is what Planck has done um, in polarization, you can actually use these millimeter polarization measurements to get a handle on the magnetic field in the galaxy. This image from Planck uh, shows the intensity of dust emission uh, from the Milky Way um, with the galactic plane along the middle. And the lines, the tracing of the lines show the inferred magnetic field directions by looking at how dust grains align themselves in the magnetic field of the galaxy. They tend to align themselves perpendicular to magnetic field, and then they emit preferentially along their long axis. And so when, if we can look at how the dust grains get polarized by making a map at these wavelengths, then we can just flip all the polarization angles by 90 degrees and get a map of the magnetic field. Um, so this is, it's, there's, there's rich information there. There's, there's, a, there's a ton more that's come from Planck. I haven't got time to, to show it all, but what, one, the message I want to, want to give is that Planck has been wonderful, but we're not yet done. <laughs> there can be sometimes a, a perception that the CMB has been measured, the Planck satellite has, has done it, has seen it, and, and we're over. And that's absolutely not the case. Um, there is such an enormous amount of information left to get out, both from the CMB um, and from the same wavelengths that will be measured in such a CMB survey. Let me just walk through them. Um, there are these key questions. There's, there's, there's cosmology-oriented questions. We still don't know what physics describes the initial expansion of space. Um, is it inflation? If so, how did it happen? And could it be something else? We don't know what dark matter is. We want to know what the masses of the neutrino particles are. We want to know whether there are additional relativistic species that could be dark matter. And in general, how is the large scale, uh, what is the large scale distribution of mass in the universe? And is the accelerated expansion of the universe really just lambda, a cosmological constant? And coupled to those cosmology questions, um, we, we, we want to weigh in still on this really interesting question, This well-discussed question of the Hubble constant tension. And I'll, I, I say it in, in, in it like this because I'm, I'm not yet convinced that it is one, but we'll have a look at it. So when we assume this lambda CDM model for our universe um, and we take the CMB information from Planck and we infer what the local expansion rate is, we get this expansion rate 67 and a half kilometers per second per megaparsec. But when we go and measure the expansion looking at galaxy distances using Cepheids and supernovae, then the estimate comes in at 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec. 
if one calibrates the distances to galaxies with tip of the red giant branch stars, it comes in as, as around 70, where, which is more consistent with the CMB measurements. Um, so the question remains, is Lambda CDM right? Is Lambda CDM broken? Or are there systematic issues with some, of, some or all of these measurements? So one of the things we have to do in the CMB field is go checking on this one, this number. See if, see if this is really robust. And if it is robust, whether one needs new physics to explain what's going on. Beyond cosmology, um, by looking at the later time universe through looking at the effects of the CMB, the scattering, the scattering of the electrons in the universe, we can answer questions about the role of feedback in galaxy clusters. We can look for the missing baryons in the universe, although maybe they've just recently been found. Um, we can also ask questions about how long reionization takes on average by looking at these secondary effects. And then by having deeper high resolution surveys of the millimeter sky, wide surveys, we can also contribute to the study of the variable radio sky, um, see a huge number of dusty star forming galaxies and learn more about the galactic science and the magnetic fields in our galaxy. A fun thing too is one can also go searching for planets um, uh, the, the, the kind of data that we take for CMB observations is also quite well suited for searching for Planet Nine um, and asteroids and objects that are, again, thermally emitting in that wavelength. Okay, so where is it? Where are we going? So, <coughs> so we haven't got a CMB satellite right now. We've had COBE, we've had WMAP, we've had Planck. The next decade, there are preparations possibly for a for a new satellite called Lightbird from the Japanese Space Agency that would observe the sky um, at large angular resolution. But really the, the coming decade where you're going to see new results um, and new data will predominantly come from ground-based surveys. Um, because the steps that we have to make are to measure the microwave background and the millimeter sky at those wavelengths at higher resolution and intensity and in greater sensitivity in polarization. And the two main sites where that's happening in the world are pictured here. It's the Atacama Desert that I showed you to begin with, where there are currently three telescopes sighted, it's currently um, called CLASS, Simon's Array, and ACT, and I'll tell you more about this one. And then there's the South Pole, the South Pole where there's the South Pole Telescope and the Bicep Keck Telescopes. The reason they're so good for looking at these wavelengths and for looking at the millimeter sky are that it's dry. You want as little water vapor above you as possible. And these are the well-established sites where, where this activity is happening. And so I'm going to be talking <coughs> more about the Atacama site where we can see more than half the sky from. And so I'll just step you through this progression of of how we build on the Planck satellite's legacy. So Planck showed us the whole sky in nine wavelength bands, reaching down to um, about five arc minute resolution over the whole sky and spanning a third, a third of a millimeter to 10 millimeters in wavelength. The telescope that I'm gonna be talking to you about is the one, which one is I'm working on, it's called ACT and I'll tell you more about it, is currently observing about half the sky and will do so until the end of 2021. The noise levels it can hope to achieve or it is achieving will be a roughly three times lower than Planck's um, and, and it will achieve and it's, and it's measuring the sky at about one arc minute resolution. So it's higher resolution and lower noise. In the same time frame, the South Pole Telescope is undergo taking a survey at the South Pole. And then there's this next step forward that will come in the mid that's coming that will run through the 2020s uh, called SO or Simon's Observatory that I'll come on to next, um, which would be same amount of sky, but lower noise, a few times lower noise than where we are now um, and similar resolution. Um, and then a future step beyond that is CMBS4, which would have multiple telescopes. But I want to really focus on this progression of these, you know, Planck to ACT to SO. Again, that's, the, that's those are the ones that, that I'm most involved with. And they're the ones that give us the most, in, in the near term, these large maps of the sky that we can hope to do exciting science with as a community, not just, not just in the CMB. 
Okay, so let me talk about, um, about ACT. This is the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. Um, it's, it's at that site, it's pictured here. Um, it's this six meter aluminium dish telescope where the whole of this structure scans the sky as one, uh, in, in one piece, scanning the sky backwards and forwards and is surrounded by this ground screen that shields it from, from uh, emission from the ground. Um, and it's up at 5,000 meters, which again makes it very dry and, and good for observations. We've actually been working there since 2007 with successive uh, cameras inside this telescope. Um, the one that's now there is the third generation and it's got about 5,000 detectors. It's supported by the NSF um, and it's, it's led by, co-led by Princeton and UPenn. The leaders are named here, Suzanne Staggs and Mark Devlin currently. Um, and this is an image of one of some of our wonderful collaborators in our collaboration experiments. Um, okay, and so what are we doing with ACT? So we have made with ACT now, most recently, some new maps of the millimeter sky covering really almost as much of it as we can from the ground in Chile, not, not completely all of it. What I'm showing you here um, it, at the top is a, is a little image of where we've, where we've looked so far. And the top one is in galactic coordinates, so the galaxy would run along the middle. Um, and the colors just show where we've looked so far uh, with the yellow and purple areas slightly deeper observations and the blue ones not so deep observations yet. If you unwrap that into uh, equatorial coordinates, which is down here, you can unwrap it such that uh, this, this map spans in RA over the full, I'm sorry, let me go back, the full range in right ascension all the way around the sky and from minus 60 to 20 declination, so 80 degrees in span. And so this here is a new map of the sky um, that's shown here actually combines the Planck observations with new observations from ACT. Um, we've also made maps with just ACT alone. But actually, it's a very nice complementarity where from the ground in Chile, it's quite hard on the ground anywhere. It's very hard to see the largest wavelengths, the largest scales in the sky because the atmosphere um, is most contaminating there. So there's this very nice synergy where the Planck satellite has provided us with the large scales on the sky, and then we fill in the smaller scales with these new ground-based ground data. Now, this is a map of the sky at two millimeters. It does combine ACT with Planck, but you can't really see uh, that this looks any different from Planck alone um, at, this, at this scale. So I'm gonna take you on a zoom in and just show you what the, sort of, what the data looks like. This is now a little zoom in of about 150 square degrees of the sky at two millimeters of an image from Planck. So this is or, or a map from, from the Planck satellite. So this is each, the, the, the grid here is degree, has degrees, degrees on it. So each square is one square degree. And that's what we see from Planck. And this is what we're seeing here, the CMB fluctuations, the hot and cold spots that will later evolve to form the cosmic structures. If we now flip it to add the data from ACT, I do that, you see a few things happening. We see the resolution really coming, coming in here. What you should see, I'll just go back, I'll go back and forward again, back to Planck, then we add the new data from ACT. Um, you should see that the, that the fidelity of the CMB fluctuations comes is, is increased. We see them in higher, in, in higher resolution and things we couldn't see before pop up. And you also see a ton of red spots appearing, okay? Those red spots are, are, are radio galaxies. They're AGN, predominantly blazars, that are emitting um, in, our, in our wavelengths at 150 gigahertz or two millimeters. Um, and, and with that higher resolution, we just see huge numbers of them appear. You can also see in the circles here, uh, some blue spots, okay, those also appear, they're not so, but they're not visible until you have that high resolution. You see the blue spots and those are galaxy clusters. Those are the things that we see in the CMB because the CMB scatters through the cluster and that shifts the black body spectrum of the micro background 
And at this particular wavelength, that two millimeters, that means it shows up as basically a colder spot on the CMB. The blue is colder than average. And so this richness of, of um, information pops up when we have this resolution. Um, I'll zoom out a little bit more and come to a, a little bit of the sky that's about five or 600 square degrees. Again, smaller than the total, total area, but also where we have the greatest depth of observations at the moment, so the greatest sensitivity. Um, and here, the scale here is about plus or minus 500 micro Kelvin. These are really, these are really small fluctuations and they'll get even smaller in polarization. Um, so again, what you're seeing is, is, is the primary CMB fluctuations, but then on top of that, a whole bunch of, um, of these red points, which are these uh, uh, radio galaxies, as well as dusty star forming galaxies too. Um, <coughs> now, one of the great, one of the advances that we're making beyond Planck is that we're able to see the polarized sky in better sensitivity than before. So if I switch to the next image of a, of a map, what I'm showing you here is the same five or 600 square degrees where I'm showing you um, the polarization of the CMB. Um, now in grayscale, but the scale is plus or minus now 20 micro Kelvin, rather than before it was a few hundred micro Kelvin. Um, for aficionados, this is, this, this is the E mode polarization signal, which is really, but, but, but it's really the, the size of the polarization signal because here that's the only contribution. Um, it's, in, it's, the, it's the part of the polarization that is basically only produced by the velocity of the plasma at redshift of 1100, where here the black and white is, is more or less, um, sorry, the white is more, the black is less polarized than average. Now this, this may look again like a speckledy figure to you. Um, it, it's, it is exciting because it's actually a high signal to noise image of the velocity of the plasma um, of the universe at Richard of 1100. With Planck, this is just, this is noisy. But with ACT, we're able to see this where what we're seeing here really are the fluctuations in the velocity of the photon barren plasma at Richard of 1100. And so it really is a second view of the microwave background at this early redshift. Um, and that's something that we're able to really kind of go in and, and see in more detail. And if I then, and these fluctuations, again, these are the imprints of acute, the, the fact that we see these fluctuations, fine, very good. Um, but what we then want to do is take the power spectrum of them. <coughs> and what I'm showing you here is a preliminary plot from a, a paper led by Steve Choi, a new ACT paper that shows the power spectrum of the fluctuations measured not only in the temperature of the intensity of the CMB, but also in the polarization. What, let me walk you through it a little bit. Again, I'm showing you angular scale along here from large to small scales. And this on the y-axis is the power spectrum. This is now on a log scale. And if I just look at, walk you through it here, is the power spectrum of the intensity fluctuations with all the acoustic peaks. The blue is from Planck and the red are our latest data points from ACT, reaching right down to very small angular scales, pictured also with, with data from, uh, from SPT and polar bear and bicep Keck experiments. And then down here, this is the bit that I'm, I'm most excited about, which is this is the power spectrum of the polarization fluctuations, this second view of the CMB at redshift of 1100. And we see all these acoustic peaks again. Again, Planck saw, saw many of these already. The Planck data is shown here in the blue data points. But we're seeing, if we, if we look at the new data points from ACT in red, we can now count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, <laughs> and arguably just nine, acoustic peaks in the polarization power spectrum. This is a smaller signal than the intensity one, and it's a second view, and it gives us additional handle on the physics of the early universe. It's really powerful. It's powerful in a couple of ways. Um, the first way that is, is perhaps most imminently interesting is that having a cleaner measurement of so many acoustic peaks is gonna tell us more about the Hubble constant. 
because the Hubble constant is directly related to how far away the CMB is from us. Um, and, and that is imprinted in the angle that we see these acoustic peaks appear at. So if we can measure those acoustic peaks even better, we're going to learn more about the Hubble constant. And what we've been doing with an act is to try and make an independent estimate of the Hubble constant without Planck from just the act and WMAP data. Um, and just using a, a few years worth of data running up to 2016, um, we'll have, we have an estimate of the Hubble constant that gives an error of just 1.1 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Um, that paper's in preparation, we'll share it with people soon, um, and we'll be weighing in on the, on the Hubble constant tension issue. Um, and new physics as well can um, um, show up looking different to lambda CDM in these small scales. Again, with the errors, we can't, we can't do a refined chi-squared test here, but if you put in very different physics, something that might, for example, change the Hubble constant in the CMB or do something different, then this is the area that you might see different physics. Um, okay, let me move on. There's a lot of exciting stuff there. So just talking about clusters, I, showed, I pointed out there's a couple of blue spots in the map that were new clusters. That was just a little snapshot of the map. If we take the whole of this sky now, we've now found 4,000 confirmed clusters using the thermal or zodovich effect. This is the largest SZ sample ever. Um, by overlapping with the dark energy survey, with Hyper Supreme Cam and the Killer Degree survey, we're able to then get the redshifts of these clusters. And each one is shown in a, in a cross hatch here. Um, this is then a map of the sky in equatorial coordinates. And each cluster is marked with a, with a cross. And it's got a confirmed redshift. Um, now, it's exciting to have that many clusters. Uh, one of the things that we want to do with that is then, again, do cosmology. So the number of clusters as a function of mass and redshift tells us about the growth of structure. It tells us about omega matter, how much matter there is, about sigma 8, the size of the fluctuations, about the dark energy equation of state, and about the neutrino mass sum. Um, and if I show these, this is from a paper by Matt, Matt Hill, led by Mount Hilton in preparation, um, showing the cluster now, cluster masses as a function of redshift. Um, this is in blue, this is this new sample of 4,000 clusters um, shown as a function of their um, SZ derived mass and redshift. And what's wonderful about the SZ effects, it's not redshift dependent. So you go right on out in masses out to a redshift of 1.9 here. Um, and we can see how the cluster sample um, complements the purple one of Planck and the red, orange, and green one of the South Pole Telescope. Um, so this is this will be a, this is a rich, rich data set. Um, we again we the, this experiment was targeting the CMB, but we're thrilled to have data about the galaxy too. Um, and so I'm just now showing you a little snapshot of uh, a two by four degree little, little snippet of the sky um, measured by the Planck satellite at these three different wavelengths, um, a couple of millimeters. And then when you add the Planck, the ACT data, you get to increase the resolution quite significantly. And you get to see the dust from the galaxy, the, fe the, the features just pop out at these wavelengths. Now, of course, there's beautiful measurements at different wavelengths by Wise and other, other measurements that show up this, this emission. But at these wavelengths, we previously couldn't see the resolution to really go into detail about what's happening in this, in this dust emission from, from, the, from the galaxy. Um, and there's also polarization information, which will be really interesting um, in this too. So there's, there's a lot more to get out of it. Um, I haven't got time to show you everything from, from ACT. There's, there's, a, there's thousands of, of AGN and dusty point sources, and there are nice measurements of the gravitational lensing of the CMB too. Um, and so that will, that's certainly going to keep us and we hope the community busy for, for a while. But there are things that we want to do from the millimeter sky that we can't do with ACT because we can't pack any more detectors in the telescope. That's the limit of our, our telescope is they're full of 5,000 detectors and there is no more room in the focal plane for any more. So 
rather than instead of observing for decades to come, we'd have to wait a long time to get where we wanted want, want to, to reduce the, the sensitivity, to lower the sense, to, sorry, to raise the sensitivity or increase our science, we need more, we need to have more detectors. So what we're doing is constructing a new telescope uh, pictured on the right here, which is going to have the same resolution and cover the same amount of sky, half the sky, but be able to pack in more detectors with a different optical design, 10 times more detectors, um, to be able to lower the noise a factor of a few times below where we are or where we'll be at the end of ACT. Um, and, and just to comment on this too, I'm talking about the telescopes happening sort of in the next five years or so. The vision then forward is that the CMBS4 experiment that um, many of you may have heard of would then have multiple ones of these, these telescopes to reduce the, to, to, to increase sensitivity yet further. Plus also some small telescopes, which I'll get to just in a couple of moments. Okay, so what is that with this SO? This is then the next, this is the next step for us in Chile in terms of wide field surveys. SO is an even bigger collaboration. It brings together a couple of the CMB experiments. It brings together ACT, Polar Bear and Simon Zaray, who are working in Chile, and a lot of experts from Planck too have joined us. Um, this is a, it's a, currently a privately funded project funded by the Simons Foundation and the Heising Simons Foundation and institutional contributions, um, but already has more than 200 collaborators, some of them are pictured here. Um, and, and it's, the construction is underway. Um, it's going to go next to the ones here in Chile. So here we are, here's an image of the current, that current site, the CMB site, ACT and CLASS and Simons Array. And the Simons Observatory is due to go on this plateau just next to them at that same 5,000 meters elevation. And it will be composed of this one big new telescope, um, plus three smaller ones that again, I'll, I'll just mention um, in a moment. Um, and, and so the construction is well underway. We're all very excited about it. And again, just to, just to let's, I want to orient you here. I said that our current telescopes that measure this millimeter sky, they just don't fit enough detectors in them. And so what we're doing here, what you're seeing here on this left, on the left, and this is pictured in the high bay at, at UPenn, um, at Mark Devlin's lab, um, is we now have this camera that we're building that whose focal plane is this enormous size, this size basically of a king size bed that you can pack 10 times more detectors in. And that just gives you the greater sensitivity. Um, and so you can see it here, it's, this, it's much bigger than we're used to dealing with um, for similar CMB experiments. So that the, the, um, it's, it's been this great step up in technology to, to design it and to imagine putting all the detectors inside it. It'll go inside this telescope um, here, the one that's going to sit on that same site in Chile. Um, which again, it's, it's a still a six meter primary dish, um, but the whole structure, <coughs> excuse me, is much bigger uh, than ACT, for example. You can see this, this is just a rendering where a person size is this big, so the whole thing is about 15 meters tall. Um, and it's being constructed right now in Germany at the Vertex Company. Um, and it's also going to measure these, these, these six wavelength bands from one to 10 millimeters, actually adding on the very shortest wavelengths um, that, that currently we're not measuring with ACT. Um, and it'll currently have more than 30,000 detectors inside it, a big step up from where we've been, um, and actually has room for even more to be packed in in, in future years um, inside that focal plane. So it's underway. Um, it's going to be doing a lot of the same science areas that I mentioned before. It's going to be measuring the primordial CMB, the late time signals, the dusty galaxies, 20,000 galaxy clusters, the galactic science. One thing I want to highlight here is the opportunities in transient science that we're excited about. And we sort of, well, we would welcome, welcome community input on, 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 um, on building our science case and pipeline for this too which is that we're going to be measuring up to about 100,000 AGN. Um, and we map the sky almost every day, half the sky. And so we'll be able to track thousands of them on a daily or weekly or monthly basis at these six wave bands 
from one to 10 millimeters. We've seen great variability in our data already, um, but to be able to track their light curves um, throughout the five-year survey, we think will be, will be really exciting. Um, and we want to build that, build that into um, our, our analysis plans even further. It's also possible we could find um, millimeter transients that haven't been found yet. For example, the orphan afterglows of gamma ray bursts could show up as a transient um, in our data. There's one potential detection of that made with the South Pole Telescope. Um, there could be hundreds in, in this new data, if that's indeed true. And there is the potential to a follow up of Rubin Observatory optical transients. This is an area that we, again, we're building. We haven't had that such expertise in our community of doing that, but the, date, the, the, the sources are there and the, and the data are going to be there. Okay, I'm just gonna, a couple more slides and I'll, then I'll, then I'll um, uh, be done. Um, this huge synergy of, of the new data from the new observations from SO with optical surveys. The timeline's the same, but we're gonna run from 2023 to 2028. We overlap time-wise and then also spatially with a lot of the observations from Rubin Observatory, uh, DESI and Euclid. Um, and the CMB and optical surveys together will be able to measure the large-scale matter and baron distribution and with their different handles on it can then work together to do better so that we're both better together measuring the growth of cosmic structure, constraints on baronic feedback and then also calibrating each other's systematic effects by cross-correlating. And we're already, there's a lot of, a lot of overlapping work happening between these, these different surveys. Um, and coupled to that, we feel, you know, both ACT and SO, and I think this is true of the CMB community as a whole, is to be community oriented. So, you know, with regular planned releases of maps, of catalogs and likelihoods, um, on, on Lambda and other platforms. You know, we're only really gonna be a success if we feel like the community are using our data. Um, and related to that, also that must involve making code and notebooks and tutorials for people to actually access our, our maps and use them. Um, lastly, this my, my, I wanted to focus my talk on the large field surveys um, and then the, these maps that we can make. We will also be searching for gravitational waves from the early universe with these three small telescopes from ESO that are particularly designed to look for this signal that's actually quite large scale in the sky and it's hard to disentangle from the atmosphere. So you have to design something really targeted at that signal. We'll be searching for those as will colleagues at the South Pole with South Pole telescopes with the South Pole Observatory. And together we'll be seeking to reduce current limits by an order of magnitude and look for detection. So that will be exciting too. So to, to wrap up, there's more to learn um, from the wide field millimeter sky. Um, the CMB gives us a view of the early and now the late time universe. And the millimeter sky has such a lot of information about the galaxy, about AGN, dusty galaxies, and even potentially planets. The coming decade, we should see new millimeter maps covering half the sky from ground-based data. Um, and there's already a wealth of new data coming from ACT and we look forward to sharing it soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe, for a wonderful talk. Um, so as uh, you all know, the, um, you can ask questions through the uh, question and answer window. And I see that we already have quite a few. If you, you see a particularly interesting question that someone else has asked, uh, you can upvote it and can see which ones uh, are there. And so I'm just going to go ahead and um, read, read a question to Joe and we'll, we'll go until we run out of time. Okay. So uh, Ruby Byrne uh, says, wonderful talk, thank you. For these ground-based telescopes, to what extent does Faraday rotation from the ionosphere contaminate the polarized um, power spectrum measurement? That's a very good question. So not, not very much at all. So the wavelengths that we, so, so I said that in the wavelengths we're measuring, so typically up, down, up, up as high as 10 millimeters or in frequency down to 30 gigahertz, Faraday rotation is not such a big problem. So if we were going down to like one gigahertz or something, it would be a bigger deal. But to our frequencies, it's, it's um, pretty negligible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question. Kundan asks, uh, can the improved CMB power spectra say something about the variation of Hubble's constant over time? That is the cosmic evolution of H, H naught. H of Z, I guess. Uh, I see. No, so, so, so not, a, not a lot. So it depends. So I'm not, I'm not, let me see if I've answered it correctly. So, um, it can contribute to, to measuring H of Z in terms of um, if you're trying to understand, for example, H of Z that, that's connected to a varying expansion rate. 
we have an access on that through these secondary effects, the lensing mm -hmm. of the CMB and the number of clusters. They will map on to, for example, a changing expansion rate. Mm -hmm. um, but we aren't able to, for example, see temporal change. So, for example, we can't go back and look at the CMB and see something in real time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next question from Blake Ledger. Uh, um, says very interesting indeed. Uh, is there a point where the observations become too sensitive to the point that the science focus shifts from studying the CMB to studying those radio uh, bright sources as they continue to appear? It's a really, it's a really good point. Um, so it depends on the scale. So if we look at the, um, it's already true that at the smallest scales that we can observe from ACT, if I look at the power, for example, even if I take out all of the bright sources I can see and detect and I remove them from the map, mm -hmm. um, if I then compute the power spectrum, all the fluctuations at the smaller scales, they're all point sources. It's already dominated by point sources. The CMB is gone because the CMB mm -hmm. just is, is dived off by them. Um, so, um, um, so, but at larger scales, um, it's still there. And so, uh, it's certainly becoming, becoming the case that the point sources are in there. But if, if we're thinking about measuring, you know, sub degree scale, but not arc minute scale, then we should be, we should be good for the, for, and anything where the CMB has signal, we shouldn't be dominated by sources um, with this, these coming experiments. Yeah. Okay. Next question from uh, Robert Nikuta. Uh, the minima of the polarized light power spectrum seems to appear where the maxima of the total power spectrum are. Why is that? Good spotting. Yeah, actually, I should meant to call that out myself. Absolutely. It's exactly, it's exactly the case that the peaks of the polarization appear in the troughs of the temperature. And it's, not, it's a derivative. So basically, the, the peaks in the CMB are predominantly from the density fluctuations at redshift of 1100. And the polarization are from the velocity. And the velocity is basically the derivative of the density. So it's exactly the case that where you see the polarization peak, you see a temperature trough. And it's also then why I didn't get to focus on it, but a really important signature is the cross correlation of the two. And that's super sensitive. So yeah, excellent. Yeah, question. Okay, uh, next question. Do you expect problems with your survey doing, due to the recently not launched and future launches of satellites by SpaceX? Well, that's an interesting question. Yes, I think we haven't, um, I, I think we won't be so affected um, as, optical surveys will be, um, you know, there's even, I guess, some possibility that one could calibrate in some way often, but I think um, we don't expect in our wavelengths to be too affected by them, but I think we have to pay more attention and, and really check that out. I think it's more of a problem for the optical surveys. Right. Hey, next question. In the TT spectrum, why do the ACT and SPT data disagree for L greater than about 2,500. Yeah, I didn't get to explain that either. It's because the SPT ones still have the point source power left in them. So um, I'll just skip back up to the uh, here. Sorry, we're getting there. there. Um, if I look here, yeah, I, I, and actually, so when you actually measure this, this, this power spectrum of the maps, what you get is a sum of the power spectrum from the CMB and from the, the, points, the point sources. Um, and so for ACT, we do a component separation method and marginalize over the source contribution so that our red points are our estimate for the CMB by itself. And the SPT data points are their public data points that still have the point sources left in them. Now, of course, they account for that when they do their own analysis, but the data points still have the sources in. So mm -hmm. that's, yeah. Okay. Here's, a, here's a question that, uh that I noticed, I also noticed you, you skipped. Can you measure B mode polarization? Uh, yeah, I did skip that. Yes. Yeah, so, so, okay. So to, so let's see. So, okay. So the, let's talk about B modes quickly. So um, the motion of the photon baryon plasma at recombination when the CMB forms shouldn't produce any B modes. And that's because it's all from basically symmetric infall of electrons around over densities. And B modes are a handed polarization pattern that give a curl um, around any given point in the sky. So the, the, the physics of the last scattering surface shouldn't produce B modes. There's two, way, there's two things that produce B modes. One is the fact that that signal then gets gravitationally lensed on its path to us, and that can distort the signal to produce B modes. And then also, if you have gravitational waves passing through at the time the CMB formed, those also can produce B modes. 
So these measurements from SO will exactly look for the BMOs coming from gravitational waves. That scale, the one degree scale that they are imprinted at, we are not sensitive to with ACT because the atmosphere is troublesome for us with the design of ACT. You want, and this is why it's the bicep and keck experiments that right now have the best constraints on large scale B modes. They're designed to look for it in the same way that these SO telescopes were designed for it. ACT has not got, the, the detail is this, uh, this thing called a half wave plate that if you spin it to modulate the signal, you can try and tease out the signal from the atmosphere. We, we are seeing signals of the B modes um, just about coming from lensing. We see the lensing effect at high significance, the B mode itself, not at strong significance. Again, I did skip past it. I'll just, sorry, go back to the plot. Again, it's, it's down here. Like this, this is the BMO signal from lensing here. And you can see our red data points are consistent with the, what you'd expect from Lambda CDM. Um, these are measurements from the South Pole Telescope, having measured it already. At these scales where you might look for gravitational waves, these are the data from Bicep Keck, which have the world leading constraints on that right now. That's where we'd be seeking to improve with this, those small telescopes from ESO. Okay, so we're, we've actually uh, used up our time, but um, um, there are a number of further questions. And if Joe, you'd like to, I think you can also see the Q&A uh, questions. So if you, you should feel free and those people who've asked them uh, to stick around and, and, and continue. Um, be, I'd like to just remind everybody that uh, after this talk, uh, the iPoster sessions uh, is starting in just a few minutes. Uh, there's a, a webinar for the, the NED IPAC database if you're interested. And then this evening, I believe at 6.30, uh, the um, CSWA meet and, and greet. So, and of course, there's all of tomorrow. So I encourage you all to take part. So again, Joe, feel free to stick around and uh, as much energy as you have to continue answering questions. But I'd Good like job. to thank everybody so much uh, for coming. And thank you, Joe, for a wonderful talk. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Um, great. Okay, so yeah, let's let's go. I'm just going to check that I've... Okay, good. So Glenn, Glenn, Glenn Langston, um, I'll go to your question next. So how important is all scale observations of the CMB? How important is a northern site? That's a really good question. So we would definitely love to have uh, more area. The better, the more area, the better um, in terms of our constraints on cosmology. Um, one number in particular that we'd like to measure is the number of relativistic species in the universe. Is it just three neutrinos or other extra ones produced in the early universe? If you could see more, you'd be doing better. But you can do a lot from Chile with 40% of the sky. We're trying to see if we can squeeze it up to 70% of the stuff that you can actually see. Um, so I think as a community, we think it's worth exploring northern sites, but we're not, lim we're not in, the, in the near future limited by it. Um, the right now is actually um, an exploratory experiment going to, um, to Tibet, where the conditions are good. The, the two possible sites are Tibet and Greenland. Um, but they ha they're not well, well enough developed to be, to be kind of putting intense um, projects there yet, but they could be. Um, okay, uh, Dieter Hartmann, will you cross-correlate your cluster data with Erosita data? Uh, absolutely, we hope so, yes. So there are people in the collaboration, including Jack Hughes, um, who are well-connected and thinking about the connection of Erosita and our cluster sample. So absolutely. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a natural thing. And again, the, the context here is if you can see clusters in the SZ and in X-ray, and you can measure them in the optical and get their weak lensing masses, then you can really hope to nail down the, an understanding of, of the clusters and also understanding of the, the cosmology from them too. Um, yeah. Uh, Jeff, um, what's the prospect for detecting primordial gravitational waves for these projects? Yeah, let me come to that. I had to, I just was, I was there, um, uh, pretty fast. Uh, let me just, sorry, let me. Ah, sorry. Sorry, I went the wrong way. Um, let me just go. I didn't, I didn't say much about this. So right now there are upper limits on the gravitational wave amplitude expressed by the tensor scalar ratio R. And R right now is constrained to be less than 0.06 from the Bicep Keck telescopes. Um, 
the error that we expect to get from SO, which is actually rather similar to what's expected from the South Pole parallel program, should reduce that by an order of magnitude to an error of about 0.003 or 0.002. Um, and, and then one could go even further by having more of your telescopes, which is what's planned for CMB stage four. Now, if we can get an order of magnitude below where we are, then we could quite possibly see it. So let's say, for example, that R is 0.01, that the tensors are 1% of the scalars. Then if that's the case, then we should be able to detect it with SO. Um, and then I think the exciting thing is that we would hope to detect it with SO, detect it at the South Pole, and then be really convinced that it was <laughs> there and, and not some contamination. So that's definitely what we're going for with these small telescopes from SO, and as I said, as with the South Pole program as well, is really trying to detect um, something. Once you go much below R of 0.01, I, I, you have to start being really careful you understand the galactic foregrounds, and I think we'll wait and see how, how bad they look with the new data. Um, okay, next question, uh, Marcial Becquerel. Um, why do you use TES detectors? And because uh, KID detectors are also a good option. This is a really good question. So yeah, we use these transition edge sensors detectors, um, which operate because they have a, a temperature dependent resistance of the transition of the superconducting phase transition. Um, we've long used them. One of the challenges from them is readout of so many thousands of the detectors. Um, and there are also these, these alternative um, kinetic inductance devices that, that, could, be, that could be better um, or could be a better option given how many than we want. I think many of us would like to see that proven. It's very hard to, there's, there's, there's still R&D that has to go into showing that those would work. So there are groups certainly who are exploring using kids detectors in CMB experiments. Um, and so it may be that the field does move to using them or them in a combination of TESs. But for the sort of stuff that we're putting in on the field in the next couple of years, we wanted to stick with the technology that, that we knew was already kind of more proven. Um, okay, um, then question from Amit. Can you relate your results with the inflation theory? Yeah, absolutely. So I didn't really talk about that too much, but we want to be testing. So right now, all of the results that one has measured, we've measured from Planck and it measuring from uh, so far from the ground are consistent with the idea of inflation in the early universe. But we don't yet know that it's true. And so some of the things one wants to check are, can we see gravitational waves? And also can we better measure the scale dependence of the initial scalar fluctuations, the ones that produce the temperature fluctuations? And can we see any non-Gaussian fluctuations? So actually, we're going to be searching for these different things in this data. We're going to search for gravitational waves. We're going to search for deviations from a power law of the scalar fluctuations by going to smaller scales. And we're going to search for non-Gaussian fluctuations. And so some of those tests will be done from the large telescope with this large field, high resolution. But the gravitational wave search will be dedicatedly done with these, with these, these small ones here. Um, okay, uh, great. I think we are done. If you think that I have not answered your question, uh, I'm not sure how to find it. I think I've answered everyone's questions. Um, please feel free to ask it again if you think I didn't answer your question. Um, and so if not, I'll just, I'll just hang around here for a couple of minutes and then if not, then, um, um, then uh, Thanks, thanks for joining. Thanks for your comments. Uh, there's a question, do you accept problems from SpaceX satellites? I think, so I mentioned this earlier, so we think that, um, that in our wavelengths we should be um, uh, probably okay compared to some of the, op the problems with the optical, but actually this is still something that as a community we're trying to explore is, is how much emission or not one would expect in our wavelengths that could be contaminating. So I think this is still, still to be understood, but likely not as much as an issue um, for us as, as for the optical. 
Cool. Thanks for your comments. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna drop off now. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, and um, uh, yeah, look out for our data. We'll be giving some talks when we actually put, uh, do our big data release from ACT. We'll we'll do some some videos, um, short videos alongside those as well. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye.